today we have uh, a lecture on the subject of print in chandranagar post 1879 negotiating metropolitan regime changes and intersecting colonialisms by dr shobhra ray who is a junior fellow with the nmml doing research on the subject of the french in india is a very very important uh, concern should be an important concern for all of us the reason being that too much attention has been paid to the english language sources and of course uh, uh, attention has also been paid uh, to the portuguese sources based in goa but uh, comparatively little attention has been paid to the small possessions that france was left with in india after the british were finally able to uh, establish their hegemony here now two such possessions were pondicherry and chandranagar probably two of the most important possessions there were some other very small possessions which the french continued to have in india and even here it is pondicherry which has got the bulk of the attention i think that's one of the arguments that shobhra is going to make perhaps that uh, uh, out of uh, uh, all the french possessions it is pondicherry that has got the bulk of the attention and possessions like chandranagar have not really uh, received the scholarly attention that they deserve so i'm glad that uh, she is uh, working on uh, the sprint culture in chandranagar and the interesting thing is that uh, she is taking up uh, a period uh, about uh, chandranagar on which not much research has been done that is uh, pre 1900 period between 1879 and uh, 1900 so i welcome dr shubhra ray and i welcome uh, all other participants uh, who have uh, taken time out this afternoon uh, to join us on this webinar and without any further delay may i now request uh, shubhra to proceed with her lecture shubhra you have 35 minutes okay thank you dr mishra okay Good afternoon, everybody. The title for today's talk is "Print in Chandranagar Post 1879: Negotiating Metropolitan Regime Changes and Intersecting Colonialisms." Before I begin, I would like to thank the director and deputy director of Nehru Memorial Museum and Library for this opportunity to present my work. This is part of a larger project that I am pursuing here at NMML on print cultures in colonial French India, which is an attempt to map the terrain of print in the French establishments post 1816. identifying the possible focal points of authorship publishing distribution and circulation networks print cultures in colonial french india has been a neglected field of inquiry till now in both anglophone and francophone discourses despite book history being a thriving genre in india a lacuna that my research wishes to address i argue that in contradistinction to the accepted notion that the history of the colony ended with the 1754 recall of duplay or the treaties of 1814 and 1815 and given the alleged inconsequentiality of the region a print culture studies project was either not necessary or not possible french colonial india through its de facto political and economic insignificance and its status as an inversely proportional heightened cultural symbol presents a more complicated story the intersecting regulatory regimes which influenced the development of print in french india with the publications being dependent on british india as the primary market necessitates the contextualization of such a study at the convergence of british and french colonial discourses 
for my presentation today, I will be focusing on print in Chandonagor, which began in 1879. For the scene of print to be mapped in French Chandonagor from its inception, a consideration of the Comtoir's unique colonial modernity becomes necessary, something that had been neglected in Francophone historiography because of the primacy accorded to Pondicherry. Also, when print has been discussed in the context of Chandonagor, it has generally focused on the post-1900 period when the town became the center of seditious printing and the unofficial headquarters of revolutionary activities for nationalists in need of refuge from British persecution. In contrast, this paper looks at the early days of print in Chandonagor between 1879 and 1900 with special focus on three newspapers in French, English and Bengali respectively, Lopati Bengali, Dabiva and Projabondhu, after its contextualization with the history, with, I'm sorry, within the history of fluctuating metropolitan regime changes and colonial conflicts in the Indian subcontinent. This tracing of the growth and development of print is informed by the understanding that Chandonagor's pre-colonial disposition towards Vaishnavism, which created a more liberal society by challenging Brahmanical orthodoxy and the specificities of French colonialism, which permitted political representation since 1794, Beginning with the adoption of the Provisional Constitution of Chandonagor in 1791, something that has begun to be deliberated on needs careful thought, as it cannot be incorporated within the paradigms of British colonialism and the nationalist opposition to it. André François Bouhaud de Land, an officer in the Compagnie Française Orientale, founded the French establishment of Chandonagor in 1690, and but for the English occupation of the town between 1757 to 63, 1778 to 83, and 1793 to 1802, the French controlled the town till, till they were forced to leave by the referendum of 1949, resulting in the final handover to the Indian Union in 1952. Since post-1701, Chandonagar was under the administrative authority of Pondicherry, the unique history of the town, with its close similarities as well as its stark differences, not only from the rest of British-occupied Bengal, but also from Pondicherry, had not been focused on until recently. There has been a further marginalization of Chandonagar post its inclusion in the state of West Bengal, where because of the politics of assimilation and homogeneity, a town's unique colonial modernity developed through an amalgamation of Bengali and French characteristics was not considered significant enough to merit a separate category of inquiry. However, as I've pointed out, this needs to be engaged with. Of course, Chandornagar lost its importance post its decimation by the British between 1757 and 1763, when the town was systematically ravaged, beginning with the destruction of the Fort of Orleans in 1757. But before becoming a banlieue of Calcutta, it was the foremost center of commerce for the company amongst the three administrative groups that the Comtoirs and Loges were divided into, as Marguerite Labernadi reminds us. The situation changed completely by the end of the Seven Years' War in 1763 and the Treaty of Paris, which not only demilitarized the French possessions, but also marginalized Chandonagor within the French administration of India. The tension between Chandonagor and Pondicherry, however, persisted and was one of the contributory factors determining the politics of French India, along with the nature of French colonialism and the vagaries of ideological developments and their reversals that marked the history of France between 1789 and the final establishment of Republican values in 1870. As late as 1905, the complaint of Chandonagor being relegated to a marginal position remains, as is brought out by this editorial of Lapati Bengali, the first French newspaper brought out from Chandonagor. Attention needs to be drawn here to the absence of an anti-colonial nationalist movement against the French government in Chandonagor, even while it became a hotbed of sedition and the center of armed revolutionary movement against the British Raj, especially from the early decades of the 20th century, with newspapers like the Amateur Workshop, the Beaver, and the Projabondhu critiquing the British Empire for its injustices as early as the 1880s. To understand this anomaly and the specific trajectory that the development of print in Chandonagor took, which are inextricably connected, it would be necessary to contextualize this history against the background of the French Revolution of 1789 and the ramifications that it had in the metropolis as well as in the Comptoirs. This, along with the consideration of the Franco-British relationship in Europe and the subcontinent as a precondition of understanding the development of print in French India, would provide the comprehensive framework for the cultures of print in Chandonagor. 
We need to remember here that even while Joseph Francois Duple was taking Chandonago to newer heights of importance and prosperity post 1730, the town was under the rule of Pondicherry by the Royal Edict of 1701. However, this was not a bone of contention as the Compagnie des Andes Orientales was concerned only with profit and not with the nitty gritties of functioning of the administration locally. This relatively independent governance was put to an end by the defeat of France in the Seven Years' War, especially with the bankruptcy of the company and its further uh, liquidation in 1770. The King of France, who was now the ruler of the colonies, brought all the trading posts under the control of the Ministère de la Marine as a single unit to be governed by a constitution of all French occupations beyond the Cape of Good Hope. This was not well accepted in Chandonagor and Pondicherry, especially in Chandonagor, which by then had seen the destruction of Fort Orleans, rampant looting under the British occupations, and a complete demilitarization of the area by 1757. Dependent on the trade generated by the Compagnie des Andes Orientales, the resident French populace of Chandonagor came to attach hopes of their revival with the newly formed Compagnie de Calon, 1785 to 1793. Their expectations were not met as the 15-year trade monopoly in the Indian seas and the right to appoint administrators that the Compagnie de Calon had acquired by the Areth of 15 May 1785 began to be grossly misused. It is against this background of widespread discontentment that one needs to contextualize the news of the French Revolution of 1789, which led to each Comptoir having its own revolution be it the evolution of democratic and representative institutions in Pondicherry, which wanted to operate independent of the governor general based in Ile de France, the demands of fiscal reform in Karikal, or the assumption of political responsibilities in Yanam. In Chandarnagar, it took the immediate expression of popular anger against Monsieur de Montini, who had been instrumental in establishing the absolute monopoly of the Compagnie de Calon through tyrannical means and methods. The underlying cause was also the desire to be free from Pondicherry's interventions post the dissolution of the earlier company. Having articulated its aspiration to function independently from the rest of French colonies, Pondicherry had set up a municipality consisting of five members and a permanent committee of 27 members, with all the five establishments being represented in it. Chandranagar, however, refused to recognize the authority of this body and to send representatives to the Colonial Assembly of Pondicherry in 1791. Montini was detained and then sent to Paris to be tried for his erstwhile linkages to the Calon Company. Under the leadership of Richmond, who replaced Montini, the Comptoir voted for a constitution for Chandonagor on October 18, 1791. However, it needs to be remembered here that the representative institutions which came up here were meant for the French residents. These political rights of representation did not extend to the native population just yet. Orgo Basu, in his book, Chondo Nogo, recognizing alternative discourses on the colonial, has argued that it is precisely at this juncture that the intellectual and ideological differences between the British and French forms of colonialism can be located. And this is why it becomes necessary to have an alternative discourse on colonial and post-colonial politics of the French comptoirs. Drawing upon the works of Anne-Louise Germain de Stel Olstein, Tocqueville, and Pierre-Louis Roderer, he has elucidated how important the influence of the philosophes of the Enlightenment and their ideas, along with the immediate material and political conditions, was in the culmination of the 1789 revolution. These ideas of civic equality, if not political and economic rights, and condemnation of privileges reverberated in the French Indian colonies and found expression in the Constitution Provisionnelle de la Colonie de Chandonagor in 1791. The Déclaration des droits de l'homme et du citoyen, Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen of 1789, was the concretization of the revolutionary project of the establishment of civic equality so that all citizens would be governed by the same laws and be protected against their abuses, something that served as an inspiration to the Provisional Constitution of 1791. The underlying tensions that had marked the relations of Chandonagor and Pondicherry found its culmination on 7th December 1791, and I quote, when the newly elected Assemblée Générale decided to notify the Assemblée Coloniale based in Pondicherry that it no longer possessed the right to give itself the name l'Assemblée Coloniale pour tous les établissements français d'Hollande, the colonial assembly of all the establishments of French India, for Chandonagor had succeeded in constituting a new and legal constitution that does not recognize the authority of Pondicherry in that regard." Unquote. 
While the colonial subject was not yet a citizen of the French Republic, by the decree of the National Convention of 1794, even that right would be guaranteed. This decree also abolished slave trade, and by 1795, the colonies had been declared to be an integral part of the Republic and would be considered as overseas France. The abolition of slave trade did not apply to Chondonagor, as it had already been abolished there as early as 1789, while in neighboring Calcutta, it would only be abolished in 1843. However, 1794 was too late for Chondonagor, as by then it was under British occupation, which continued from 1793 till 1802. France of 1802 was qualitatively different from that of 1793, as a volte of ideologies was in progress. Under Napoleon Bonaparte, there was a reversal of republican values and a re-establishment of the monarchy of the Ancien Regime. This also meant that the policies towards the colonies changed. The colonial administrative system was further centralized, slavery was reintroduced, the rules became different for the metropolis and the colonies, and fiscal monopoly was brought back. The Bourbon Restoration, 1815 to 1830, and the July Monarchy, 1830 to 1848, did not bring any changes in the regressive colonial policies. The 19th century was a period of vacillation, as while the Second Republic, 1848 to 1852, restored French citizenship rights of natives, by 1854, this right to representation had been taken away. Again, excuse me. It is only with the establishment of the Third Republic in 1870 that Republican values began to determine colonial policies once and for all. France practiced Republican colonialism, where, with the seeds for the recognition of the colonies having been sown, the attempt was at assimilation and Frenchification. It needs to be remembered here that the idea of political representation was inconceivable in 1794 in British India. In fact, it would only be granted partially in the early 20th century after a protracted national movement. From the 1870s onwards, there was, of course, nominated representation at the municipal council levels. One caveat here, the attempt at imposing universal adult suffrage, irrespective of religion and caste, and subverting caste-based privileges in the French colonies met with resistance at various levels, and the French government had to give in to the local populace's demands of adhering to caste distinctions more often than not, as Raphael Malanga points out. Thus, the idea of man being born free and having natural rights would suffer a setback at the stage of implementation, as would the high ideal of making no distinction between the colony and the metropolis. The unintended consequences of treating the colonies as overseas France and not following an aggressive policy of the spread of Western education, unlike Macaulayism in British India, was the absence of a professional class of lawyers, teachers, and doctors who in Calcutta were not only forming voluntary associations, but also influencing public thought through print. And even if this was the Republican form of colonialism, as has been claimed, it still remained colonialism with the Pondicherry farmers paying 50% of their produce as tax. Also, the idea of political representation was not equitable, with the representative to Paris being more often than not a Frenchman. At the local level, Indians were elected too. For instance, in 1886, the mayor of Chondonagor was Mr. Pran Krishto Chaudhuri, and Mr. Rati Napul was named second deputy of the Justice of Peace in Pondicherry. Thus, while acknowledging the gaps which were there between the ideology and the implementation of Republican ideals, it cannot but be accepted that liberty, e uh, equality, fraternity, which remained the motto of France, enabled the creation of the perception of a more egalitarian colonial government than the British, with the existence of political representation in the colonies, preventing an analogous nationalist movement. The uneven development of print in the French comptoirs needs to be seen against this background. As is common knowledge, even though a printing press was found during the British siege of Pondicherry of 1761, it was a lost chance for the French to start printing early. Printing would only start in 1778 because of the war with the British with intermittent breaks. And it seems the internal politics of the metropolis, the 1789 revolution, the reversal of Republican values with Napoleon Bonaparte's regime, and then the uncertainties which formed the political history of France in the 19th century between the various republics and the different regimes had a profound impact on the manner in which the scene of print came to grow and spread in the comptoirs. Apart from the official government publications, the Archive Administrative des Etablissements Français d'Hollande, the administrative archives of the French establishment in India, a periodic report on the French administration, which was started in 1827 and went on to become the Bulletin des Actes Administratifs des Etablissements Français de Land, 
bulletins of the administrative acts of the French establishments in India, 1828 to 1866. And finally, the Bulta Officiel des Etablissements Français de Land, 1867 onwards, Pondicherry had its first newspaper in 1849, L'Impartial de Pondicherry. An understanding of the political compulsions of the metropolis helps us figure out why newspapers of the day were hesitant to take a specific ideological position. For instance, in the prospectus of L'Impartial de Pondicherry, published on 21st May 1849, the editor refuses to take an ideological stand even while accepting that liberty, equality, and fraternity would be its motto. This was not only the position of newspapers from the colonies, but also of those being published from Paris. For instance, even after the establishment of the Third Republic in 1870, newspapers like Le Journal de Paris were cautious about taking an ideological stand. This tendency could also explain the contradictory changes which affected the realm of print in French India. As early as 1827, a public library was established in Pondicherry, which was open to Indians from 1837, signifying an intention of propagating print and French culture, but this was not followed up with an expansion of the schooling system, which would have created a new category of readers, like in British India. The Calcutta Public Library came up in 1836 to cater to a professional class which was already in place. And again, by 1840, an attempt at surveillance of the native press in the colonies had been initiated. This, however, would become fully effective only by 1873. So, like the beginning of print, this was a case of early initiation for registering and regulating the press without the necessary follow-up as compared to the British, who had a more systematized approach to the native press, even though the Indian Press and Registration of Books Act in British India comes much later in 1867. Thus, the internal politics of the metropolis, as well as the conflict with the British in the Indian subcontinent and elsewhere, cost France dearly in terms of the development of its colonial agenda in an orderly manner. For Chandonagar, these disruptions meant that printing started much later in the 1870s. La Petit Bengali, a French newspaper published from Chandonagar, is available from 1883 at the Bibliothèque Nationale. However, since 1883 is notified to be the fourth year, one can assume that the newspaper started in 1879. The first Bengali weekly, the Proja Bondhu, started in 1882 with others following suit. In my research till now, I have hardly found any books which were published from Chandonagar. Even if the writers are from there, the books are usually published from presses in Calcutta. The only exception has been a French Bengali dictionary published from Bias Press in 1885, written by Ramanath Bondopadhyay and Shoshi Bhushan Chattopadhyay. What is interesting is that even school textbooks in French, meant to be used in Chandonagar, were being published from presses in Calcutta. A case in point would be Méthode de Lecture à l'usage de l'école gratuite de Chandonagar, uh, reading methods to be used in free schools in Chandonagar by Marc Barthé. This was printed at the press of PSD Rosario in Calcutta in 1871. I will primarily be, primarily be looking at newspapers then, between 1870s and 1900, the presses which published them and the political ideologies which led to their genesis and publication. One finds reference to a number of newspapers, but in the absence of extant copies, it becomes difficult to ascertain any other information regarding them. One find mentions of Chondo Nagar Prakash, 1892, edited by Nirod Chandra Mukhopadhyay, Bongo Bondhu, 1898-1902, edited by Jogendra Kumar Chattopadhyay, Tit for Tat, 1887, edited by Shirish Chandra Basu and Kushum Kumar Bondhopadhyay, Kito Shadini, edited by Nirod Chandra Mukhopadhyay, The Monthly Mukul Mali, edited by Kedarnath Ghoshal, Bongo Prabha, Bharat Darpan, edited by Agornath Mukhopadhyay, The Telegraph Review, edited by Onnoda Prashad Chattopadhyay, and The Chandanagar Gazette, 1885, edited by Shoilendranath Pal. To come to the newspapers and journals regarding which more data is accessible and which enable us to form an idea about the scene of print, the target audience, and most importantly, the market, it is necessary to divide them into pre and post 1900 groups. Post the revolutionary turn that the Indian nationalist movement took in British India, Chandan Nagar became a center of sedition and a refuge for violent revolutionary activities, as is well known. The newspapers which were published post 1900, like Matri Bhumi, Shebok, Proja Shokti, Nagorik, to name only a few, have been referred to in studies of Indian revolutionary movements, even if their print histories were not the focus of such studies. The Standard Bearer 1920 is counted as a journal from Chandonagar, but it was published and printed from the Metcalf Press in Bolaramde Street in Calcutta and was the exposition of the thoughts of Sri Aurobindo, who by then was a resident of Pondicherry. And again, even though Probortok was initially published and printed in Chandonagar, it also began to be published from Calcutta after 1925, 
once their printing press was established there in 1921. There are areas of overlap here, but in the case of a ban by the British government, Probotuk was treated as originating from Chandanagar because its publisher was a citizen of French India. And again, Graham Shaw, through his examination of the Crown representatives' records, has written about the ways in which British censorship of publications was evaded by Indian nationalists by printing as well as importing material to the non-British enclaves. However, the pre-1900 newspapers, which have hardly been researched as early as 1880s, demonstrate an awareness of the injustices of the British Empire and a robust critique of it, along with celebrating the electoral representation and other rights available to the Indians in French India, so much so that the Bengali newspaper Proja Bondhu is interdicted as early as 1889. What is interesting is that, Depending on the language that they were being published in, French, Bengali, or English, there is a change in the manner and the emphasis with which issues are dealt with, as will become clear with in the discussion here. La Petit Bengali, as has been mentioned, is the first French newspaper to be published from Chandanagar. The gérant or the manager of the press was Claude G. Dumen for 1883, and it was printed at the printing press of Petit Bengali on Rue Général Martin. The paper started in 1879 and it continued to be published regularly till 1898 by Dumen. The paper was closed for a period of seven years and was started again on 16 se September 1905. During its second avatar, it was printed from the Coral Press and was edited by E.T. Gallopin. While Pati in a literal translation would mean small, it was by no means a pejorative term. Petit was an adjective associated with journals in the sense of a resume or a summary, with a number of newspapers coming out of Paris having it as a part of the title. For instance, if one looks at the circulation figures of Parisian newspapers for 1880s, one notices that most newspapers like Le Petit Journal, La Petite République Française, Le Petit Parisien, to name only a few, have it in their titles. As the issue of 28 August 1883 mentions, one could subscribe to the newspaper in Pondicherry and in Brussels at the office of L'Independence Belge, the independent, Bel independent Belgium, with separate rates for India and Europe, signifying the target readership. By October 1883, the subscription offices could also be found in Calcutta and Paris. The paper has as its motto, Dio e Patri, God and Fatherland, and asserts that it believes in free and fair journalism and not kowtowing to the government. I translate and quote, La Pati Bengali is not a financial enterprise, nor does it want to convert public opinion by persuasion as a semi-official or auxiliary newspaper. Its motto aptly expresses its thoughts in that it wants to serve at liberty, freed from both personal ambition and servitude, unquote. It was aimed at the resident French and Francophone population in Chandanagar, Calcutta and Pondicherry, which also included Belgians residing in Calcutta, anxious to get news of their part three. The paper concentrates on French India. It carries news of births, deaths, and marriages, as well as arrival and departure of ships from Calcutta and Bombay. While the Bengal, Bengali and English newspapers are concerned with influencing public opinion in British India, for this paper, concentration on the issues and ideas specific to the various parts of land Francais, French India, was more important. It critiques the English newspaper, The Indian Republic, being published from Pondicherry in 1889 for not carrying any news specific to Pondicherry even while carrying the motto of the French Republic, Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité, and not announcing its intentions clearly in this regard. It does carry world news and news from British India, but unlike the amateur workshop and the beaver, which devoted a substantial portion of their space to these, here it stays on the margins. Unless, of course, news from British India can be compared with developments in French India, like in the critique of the protests against the Ilbert Bill. The protest against the Bengal rent bill and Ilbert bill that is Amindars of Bihar is covered in detail as this was a case which resonated with the French idea of abolition of privileges. As has been discussed, this was one of the founding principles of the French Republic and its violation attracted censure by La Petit Bengali. In its critique of the Pondicherry newspaper Le Progrès, the progress, the paper argues that if European privileges are to be abolished, the differentiation between certain Indians on the basis of existing privileges cannot be justified. The caste system is being critiqued here, of course, and the tensions that prevailed in land Francaise over the implementation of similar laws for all. For attempting to place the privileges snatched from the Europeans in the hands of some Indians, Le Progrès is termed a clerico brahmanic paper with the counsel given that it should obliterate the word egalite from its motto, as it clearly did not believe in it. The reportage had concluded that these were happening for sure under the influence of Governor Monsieur Druhe, who was known for his interference in due processes of the government. 
The paper had to critique not only his authoritarian suspension of the mayor of Chandonagor by Druhe, but also had protested against the terming of Lopati Bengali, a satanic newspaper, Vue o Diable, owing its allegiance to the devil. Tensions got further escalated when Dumen, the editor of the newspaper, got re-elected in the municipal elections in contradistinction of the wishes of the governor. Dumen, however, believes that this animosity was because of the nature of independent journalism that he was pursuing, and he takes credit in being in the company of 220,000 citizens who believes in this kind of a free and fair press as a hallmark of the Republic. The fact that the press in French India was doing its job is also manifested in the attack on the printer and Gérard of the contemporary newspaper Proja Bondhu by unknown persons. I translate and quote, an attempt to intimidate the printer and manager of Proja Bondhu was made by unknown persons who do not like the revelations being made no more in Bengali than in French. One manner of not fearing the press is to not commit a crime and follow the right path. This would not work out with a sold out press, but that is evidently not the case with either the Bengali or the French newspaper from Chandonagor." Unquote. The newspaper being thus ratified, Proja Bondhu was the first Bengali paper from Chandonagor. It was a weekly newspaper and the gerons or managers of the press were Tinkori Banerjee, Shimon Toshur and Ashutosh Sen for the various years till 1887. It was printed at Bias Press Chandonagor, while the Bibliothèque Nationale collections begin from 4th September 1883, the long editorial in the issue of 19th September 1884, celebrating the completion of its two years, permits us to fix the date of the beginning of the paper to 19th September 1882. The newspaper continued till 1889, but issues till 1887 only are accessible at the Bibliothèque Nationale, except for the six articles from the year 1889 available in the India Office records which were translated for the purpose of prosecuting the paper for sedition and which led to its eventual prohibition. Right from the outset, the Projabondu establishes itself as a newspaper which is brutally critical of the British Raj. Along with reportage on elections within French India and a regular section on world affairs, the newspaper devotes half of its space to minutely following the lapses of the British Empire, especially the failures of the legal system following the controversy surrounding the introduction of the Ilbert Bill in 1883. The newspaper also follows over several issues, the cases of rape of Indian women by British men and the absence of legal consequences for such actions. The issue of 2nd January 1884 under the title Pasho Bingra Jerot Tachar, the tortures inflicted by the bestial British, chronicles the case of a 15 year old girl who was raped by a British man. What the paper focuses on is that the complaint was not initially registered and when it was, the judgment was not only given in the absence of the uncle who had made the complaint, but a further case was filed against the uncle for cooking up a false case. A similar report on the rape of a coolie woman in Assam is reported in the 9th May 1884 issue. In a follow up to the case on 8th August 1884, the British government is viciously critiqued for the minimal punishment meted out to the Sahib and the attempted muzzling of the Indian press, which was seen as being too critical of the Raj. The greatest criticism is reserved for the lawyer of the accused, Babu Rashbihari Ghosh, who had successfully brought down the incarceration to a mere three months for this heinous crime. The editorial of 19th September 1884 sums up this critique aptly beginning with the assertion that the completion of two years of the newspaper comes at an opportune moment, the editor goes on to state, I translate and quote, the British rule in India had placed the Indians under an inexplicable spell. In the aftermath of the Ilbert Bill and the establishment of the European Protectionist Assembly, the Indians have understood that the English are not fit to be our gurus, which we had believed them to be. Rather, they are merely committed to a self-centered pursuit of earning money and making the triumph over Indians conspicuous. What is becoming clearer is the hatred and contempt that the British as a nation have towards the Indians. This vitriolic critique led it to being prohibited in British India in 1889, and its subsequent bankruptcy pointed out how dependent the newspapers from French India were on the market that was British India. The tone of the English newspaper, The Beaver, was even more critical, with hard heating cartoons of British injustices, which constituted three fourths of the title page, adding to the vitriol. The first issue of 6th March 1886, for instance, carries a cartoon of Lord Dufferin obligingly ransacking the pockets of his fellow Hindu subjects. Tinkori Chakraborty was the Jero in 1886, and it was printed at the Beaver Meshkin Press on Rue de la Corderi, Chandanagar. The last issue preserved at the Bibliothèque Nationale is that of 23rd February 1887, though whether the paper continued to be published beyond this date is not known. From the issue of 15th May 1886, 
the Jeron was Bihari Lal Shah, and he continued to be so till the last extant issue, and the paper continued to be printed from the same press. The paper had promised to be, and I quote, uncompromisingly liberal in politics, unmistakably independent in opinion, unhesitatingly fearless and outspoken in language, and a vigorous advocate of national political and social reform, unquote. Promising the leader, both writers of the highest literary abilities as well as free gifts, the paper declares its aim of securing 20,000 subscribers before 16th March 1886. By the issue of 13th November 1886, the circulation of the paper had reached 50,000 copies as the announcement in bold letters above the title on the front page made it known. This is impressive not only by the standards of newspapers from Chandranagar, but also by those of British India, where contemporary Bengali newspapers were reported to have an average circulation of 20,000 copies during the period 1874 to 1880s, with some English newspapers outdoing them. The paper was available only on prior subscription, and the delivery of the paper continued to be plagued with delay as irate letters to the editor made it known. As late as 22nd December 1886, the problem still persisted. This, the anger and impatience of the incensed reader, is however taken as a sign of how much the paper is valued by the editor. It was not just British occupied Bengal, which was the market of the paper, rather from the names and addresses of the first five prize recipients who had to be subscribers and pay in advance to receive the paper, it becomes clear that it was being sent to Surat, Salem, and Ambala, along with Moimon Chinko. This pan-Indian circulation also gets mentioned in the interview of Lal Mohan Ghosh, printed in the issue of 26th January 1887, where the interviewer proudly mentions their circulation figures and the ability to influence public opinion in British India. The yearly rate of subscription was 4 rupees, while the half yearly rate was rupees 2. But unlike some French newspapers, there were no separate contacts listed for Europe, which signifies that it was aimed at primarily the Indian market. In the section Ourselves, the editor declares that the Biba was started with the aim of fulfilling a distinct want, that of speaking for everyone, which they find lacking in other newspapers. Its promise of serving the government by pointing out its failures is suitably demonstrated in a trenchant critique of Lord Dufferin, in whom, apart from literary eloquence, the paper finds no merit. The newspaper is also highly invested in the development of native press, appointments of Indians to key posts, as well as an espousal of native progress versus alien rulers. Given its content, it could very well have been published from Calcutta. The first issue of 1886 concerns itself with selection of the health officer in Calcutta, which is considered to be a scandal, not only because the native commissioners lacking in patriotism elected a foreigner who had no understanding of the sanitary requirements of Bengal, but also because of its scandalous ratification by newspapers like the Englishman. By introducing a minuscule representation of Indians in the municipal councils, the British had ensured that the responsibility of excessive taxation and other unpopular decisions fell on the shoulders of the native commissioners. The case is no different here. However, that this minuscule po political right was valued becomes clear from the human cry on attempts of diluting it. The securing of electoral representation for Indians, both in India as well as in the metropolis, is one of the objectives that the paper devotes itself to, and every attempt, even if it is a failure, is taken note of. The attempts by Lal Mohan Ghosh to get elected to the House of Commons from Deptford in 1885, and again in 1886, is commented on as a defeat with a very slim margin. Mr. Evelyn, his conservative opponent, had secured 3,927 votes, while Ghosh had obtained 3,560 votes at the general election in 1885. What is interesting is that while newspapers published from French India hold most newspapers from British India in high esteem, the sentiment is not mutual. The Omrita Bajar Potrika is rather parsimonious in its praise of a cartoon on Mr. Malabari preaching social reform to a group of animals and puts the onus of this a priori suppositions of defamatory character on its French origins. I quote, by the by, the beaver started with an ill repute, probably because it shows for its habitation Chondonogor, which is a French settlement. But we must say as yet, it has done nothing to justify the evil thing said of it, and the Indian Daily News may rest assured, if it proves a scurrilous paper, the public will never support it, be it started from Chondonogor or Pondicherry, unquote. If this is compared with the introductory preamble of the Dhumketu, a bilingual newspaper brought out from Chandonagar from 18th February 1887, the difference becomes clear. In proclaiming itself to be a patriotic newspaper devoted to the cause of truth, the Dhumketu had listed qualities that it wanted to imbibe 
as well as the ones that it abhorred in contemporary as well as earlier newspapers from British controlled Bengal. For instance, like the erstwhile Shom Prakash, it wanted to engage with political thought without indulging in psychophancy like the pioneer, wanted to be self sacrificing and fearless like the Omrita Bajar Potrika, courageous and daring like the mirror, have experience and gravitas like the erstwhile patriot, and expertise like the statesman. It, however, did not want to be arrogant like the Bengali, over sarcastic like the rice and riot, or resort to deception like the Englishman. This condemnation of the Englishman and the pioneer is a recurring theme for issues as diverse as sowing enmity between Hindus and Muslims, unnecessary critiques of the Indian press, as well as false reportage of facts. The statesman is also at the receiving end of such criticism, but the frequency is much less. The animosity between the native presses and those managed by Britishers is a recurrent theme, along with the feelings of characters of British officials who are permitted to fill important government positions irrespective of their qualifications and the hatred for educated Indians with a voice. This is to be contrasted with the meritorious and just appointments that are de rigueur in French India and the conscience, conscien, I'm sorry, conscious, conscientiousness with which the duties are carried out by such officials. The instance of Monsieur Gorel is one such case, as noted in the issue of 31st July 1886, where as the procurer, he had managed to bring down instances of thefts and robberies and created a crime-free society in general in Chandranagar during his tenure. French rule is generally seen as positive by the press, and whatever problematic factors exist are generally ascribed to the influence of the British Empire in the subcontinent. What becomes clear from this account is that the Beaver, while remaining one of the most widely circulated newspapers, continued to repose faith in the French government. To conclude, printing in French India, especially in Chandranagar, had to negotiate with uncertainties of regime changes in the metropolis, which led to conflicting guidelines being implemented and the lack of a uniform press policy. Intersecting in colonial rivalries in the subcontinent also had an effect. And for all claims of treating the French comptoirs as overseas France, with freedom of expression and the press, censorship was very much a part of the order. And yet, the perception of a more egalitarian rule based on the availability of electoral representation led to the press being more approving of the French government and the absence of a protracted nationalist movement in the colonies. The newspapers functional in Chandranagar from 1870s onwards demonstrate the changed emphasis with which issues like freedom of press, electoral representation, government appointments, and justice for women are dealt with, depending on the language that they were being published in, French, Bengali, or English. For a majority of these newspapers, especially the Bengali and English ones, the market was British India, and it made sense commercially to speak about the issues pertaining to the readers there. But that does not seem to be the only motivation. There is a greater, greater awareness of India as a whole, with British or French occupation of certain parts being merely a technicality. Of course, when the question of jurisdiction comes up, there is an acknowledgement of the rule of a certain power, but there is also a marked sense that this is at a very superficial level with the nationalist consciousness functioning subliminally. I have also noted that despite preempting certain developments like the opening of a public library and passing a bill on the surveillance of the press in the colonies, the French were not able to follow this up with concrete action in a time bound manner, which would have given them an edge over the British. In that sense, for the periodical press as well, the myth of land perdue or due place lost India that has been a dominant trope in Francophone historiography since 1766, given the reversals that the French experienced seems to persist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shubhra. Uh, we are now open to questions and comments from all the participants. Any questions, please? Can you hear me, Shubhra? Yes, yes. Yes, Dr. Yes. Mishra. I hope others can also hear me. Yes, sir. OK, all right. Any questions or comments?
it would be a record of sorts if there are no questions at all shubhra can you hear me all yes, right i can hear you uh, okay uh, this is rita i just want to ask you um, you said at one point that this was a republican form of colonialism could you uh, explain that a little more and what kind of difference do you notice with the british form after the uh, 1789 french revolution Uh, the colonies responded uh, by having revolutions of their own for instance they refused to recognize certain fiscal policies they uh, decided to have their own forms of representation and this led to the adoption of the provisional constitution of chondonogor in 1791 and there were similar uh, revolutions mini revolutions they have been referred to by marguerite labarnedi in all the five comptoirs which formed french india at that point uh, because of the revolution by 1794 the colonies had been recognized as an integral part of france and every citizen had a right to vote they could contest elections they were uh, eligible to vote in france which is why this was referred to as republican colonialism uh, however as i pointed out during my talk today there were various reversal to this trend uh with napoleon bonaparte there was a going back to the ancia regime uh, the difference between metropolis and comptoirs became clear again fiscal monopoly was imposed slave trade was reintroduced which had all been abolished by 1789 right so as i pointed out in my uh talk the whole of 19th century was a period of fluctuation of uncertainty because of the various regimes and the various republics so even though as early as 1794 political rights had been recognized uh, civil rights had been recognized these were not implemented before 1870 however because of the right of electoral representation which was lacking in uh, british india even as late as say the 1870s uh, the french colonialism was viewed with a lot more uh, how should i put it with a lot more acceptance if one could use that word rather than the british form of colonialism which is seen as completely exploitative primarily because of the refusal to grant electoral representation to the uh, subjects right so, so this is the reason that one had a protracted nationalist movement in british india whereas in french india despite a lot of failings i mean the taxes were high there was a uh, uh, inequal representation there were a lot of other problems but because of the uh, perception of a more egalitarian republican colonialism what does not see nationalist movements in the french comptoirs and this is something that has been puzzling uh, historians for a very long time because pondicherry and chondonogor were both seats of seditious movements of uh, you know it it harbored uh, refugees from british india sri aurobindo most famously but various others kanailal dotto for instance was from chondonogor motilal roy from probortok shongo was from chondonogor and they were all revolutionaries orun chondro and so on and so forth so but it's the perception you know the the right that one had because of uh, the 1789 and then subsequently the 1790 declaration that that is the reason why there is this essential distinction which is made at the level of ideas even though probably in in terms of implementation there were various overlaps between french and british forms of colonialism thank you any other question and thank you very much for a very well researched paper it seems very thank you rita di any other question Uh, all right uh, before anyone uh, else asks a question there is a small uh, clarification that i wanted uh, to seek from you shubhra uh, i think you say that uh, chandranagar's pre colonial disposition towards vaishnavism mm -hmm. um, created a more liberal society by challenging brahmanical orthodoxy mm -hmm. but in what sense uh, is vaishnavism something uh, you know Uh, in chandranagar which challenges brahmanical orthodoxy because vaishnavism is very much within the brahmanical uh, you know orthodoxy it is not a heterodox uh, sect in any manner 
so is there something specific to chandranagar where vaishnavism somehow uh, uh, seeks to challenge uh, the brahmanical orthodoxy i would like to know in bengal for instance if you look at the kind of uh, manifestation that is there especially the followers of sri chaitanya gournitai the practice that was something which went against the caste system where the caste system was in a certain sense challenged and i am referring to uh, a liberal uh, regime in that sense uh, the difference becomes clear from the fact that if you look at uh, the instances of sati for instance in chandonagar there were uh, very very few compared to nearby calcutta where as we know that sati was something which was specific to the upper castes it was not something which was uh, uh, you know which was not a pan a phenomenon rather it was very much concentrated on a specific caste so if you look at chandonagar the way in which it was uh, the way in which the society was uh, in a certain sense the way it was functioning and the kind of reactions that are there to french colonialism one has to take into consideration this early predisposition where trade and commerce allowed a certain kind of social mobility of course i'm not saying that the caste system was not there or anything of that sort but there was a lot more flexibility especially if you compare to calcutta yeah that's what i mean uh, uh, see it, it's one thing for us to uh, point out to chaitanya's movement and say that yes it uh, did uh, sort of uh, question Uh, a part of the brahmanical orthodoxy but how much uh, uh, influence it had uh, really on the society of chandranagar is something that will have to be ascertained through a detailed study because i am not sure that the bhakti saints including chaitanya who uh, sort of uh, questioned and challenged some of the notions of brahmanical orthodoxy uh, were necessarily trying to uh, uh, trying to challenge vaishnavism you see now of course vaishnavism itself has adopted different forms in different parts of india so i'm not trying to say that there is only one kind of vaishnavism but by and large you can say that in the case of bengal uh, you know the heterodox uh, influence was not so much because of vaishnavism as because of uh, uh, the influence of uh, shaktism there and of course uh, the effect of uh, uh, a special school of buddhism which had uh, mixed uh, buddhist practices with the uh, cult practices which were pre existing in bengal uh, say 2000 years ago or 1500 years ago so uh, a specific local form of religion had evolved in bengal especially in what is now bangladesh so certainly which was in some way contrasted uh, with uh, brahmanical orthodoxy certainly but what was the connection between that uh, uh, you know uh, 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 that kind of religion and vaishnavism i think uh, is something that needs to be explored further and the second when you talk about sati for example and you say that in chandranagar there were very few cases in calcutta on the other hand there were a large number of cases and uh, these uh, cases were confined to uh, the upper caste i i think you said that isn't it yes i did yes um isn't it that even in the case of calcutta actually the the number of uh, sati cases uh, in the early 19th century it was uh, uh, when you look at the total population of uh, of the place it was comparatively small and the other thing is that it was the enumeration process which was started by the british which itself encouraged uh, uh, sati what do you say on that I think that's a separate debate you know that we have had uh, lots of debates on sati i remember having this debate with you earlier as well where you had said that you know you believe that the numbers were in a certain sense uh, you know they were uh, they shown to be more so so as the sati regulation could be uh, you know uh, brought in but i think that's a separate discussion i mean why uh, whether sati was uh, something that was whether the figures were correct or you know whether it was relegated to a certain point but i think that's a separate discussion i wouldn't want to get into the discussion of sati i mean we've had lots of people talking about it lata mani tanika sarkar and others yeah, yeah, yeah. to come yeah, back actually, uh, you know the reason i asked you at this stage is because uh, naturally you are saying that there is a contrast between the religious and customary practices 
of Chandranagar and the rest of Bengal. And it is in that context you. Uh, so that is why I thought that probably it would be good. No, if uh, uh, if I could just way. explain myself better. I mean, there was one Chandranagar was known for its trade, you know, and that in a certain sense continued to dominate, uh, dominate even after uh, the colonial period started there. That is point number one. Point number two, the French were not really as uh, as uh, strict about implementing French as a language of instruction. So there was, in a certain sense, no revolt against the French language or the French form of life, for instance, because that was non-existent. I mean, English and Bengali remained the languages of instruction in French, right? Uh, because of the lack of what Macaulay did in uh, India, one does not see that kind of a backlash or that kind of an uh, absorption of a certain kind of a British culture in French India as well. So unlike Calcutta, for instance, from 1830s, where you have a certain class of educated professionals who are forming voluntary associations and who are in a certain sense active in the domain of print, you see Chandonogar still continue uh, to be dominated by uh, a certain kind of a certain kind of Profe uh, traders, certain kind of businessmen, and uh, as opposed to Calcutta, the idea of the anglicized Babu, you find these people are very rooted in religion, in tradition. What is interesting is if you look at the newspapers and you see Vive la République, but you also see Ma Chondi, Ma, uh, you know, uh, 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 references to Ma Chondi. Uh, who is, in a certain sense, the resident deity of Chandranagar. So uh, there is this very interesting, uh, it, it can seem like a contradiction to us, especially given the idea of French secularism, but it was not a contradiction to the Chandranagar manager of the press of, say, the amateur workshop or the beaver or Dhoom Ketan. So that is, that is the kind of point that I'm trying to make. All right. Any other question from anyone? Uh, sir, I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, this is Uma Shankar. Uh, uh, Shubhra, first of all, uh, thank you very much for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is a little on uh, the second half of the 18th century. Uh, in the second half of the 18th century, uh, Chandranagar was uh, under a governor. His name was Jean Baptiste Chevalier. Mm -hmm. And in the, uh, in the 1780s, 1770s and 1780s, he tried to push for uh, the uh, French cause in India by associating with uh, regional powers, particularly uh, the, uh, the, the Nawab of Awadh, and also he tried to have some kind of uh, alliance with uh, the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam too. So, mm -hmm. do you also see? So, do you also see uh, such a uh, such a such a feeling or such a motivation in the 19th century towards the end of the 19th century? the area which you are working on in newspapers or in any, any journal? Uh, actually, after 1814 and 1815, the idea that French had actually lost to the British. In fact, this is one of the ideas that I'm challenging. The accepted notion, the accepted historiography is that after 1815, French India does not merit a history because of the limited area that it had been confined to these comptoirs had been demilitarized and any idea of control over India, which had been there, say, in 1730s in Duplay or even later, before 1760s, that had been completely diminished. That was no longer there. Uh, the idea that French have of themselves is that of an ancillary colonizer who are themselves colonized by the overarching powers of the British. So, no, in the 19th century, uh, Certainly not. One does not find any kind of such attempts to control the whole of India, which certainly was the ambition in, say, uh, as late as 1750s or 1760s. And the Chevalier is generally, uh, you know, he is he's one of the people who take the blame for, in a certain sense, French being defeated, right? So, no, but these kind of ambitions were lacking after 1815 completely, especially after the defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte, it was uh, completely, uh, you know, out of the picture. Thank you, Shobra. Thank you. Thank you, Uma. Anyone else who wants to ask a question? Dr. Panda, we cannot hear you. 
you are muted dr panda you are muted there is a question here that i can see from ramu ramnathan he wants to ask you about the print technology that was prevalent in chandranagar which were the foundries and processors and master printers that these publications were relying on ramu okay. ramnathan okay thank you for this question this is something that i am personally very interested in but unfortunately i haven't yet been able to find anything regarding this the only uh, discussion that i had in this context was with an octogenarian founder of the mukti press who told me that there was a foundry earlier but uh, from the early 1940s onwards they depended on calcutta for the foundry and for the technology as i pointed out a lot of uh, overlap was there between calcutta and chandranagar and a lot of these uh, books were being printed from presses in calcutta just as you know the seditious pamphlets and books and uh, newspapers were being published from chandranagar similarly a lot of french books were being published from calcutta i point out one such uh, by mark barthe which was published in 1871 from the psd rosario press thank you any other question any other question well looks like uh, there are no more questions so uh, thank you very much uh, shubhra for your uh, insightful and uh, interesting lecture uh, on this subject and i thank all members of the audience who are present uh, uh, for this lecture today for this webinar today and uh, i think um, our next uh, webinar will be uh, the next week um, uh, rajneesh do you know about the topic all right we will get in touch with you okay thank you dr mishra thank you everybody for joining thank you thank, thank you very much bye bye see you